By the nature of the digital, the role of the library is changing in the sense that they have much more exposure than I think the, the discipline is used to. So there is a, a previous sense, I think, in, uh, in a more traditional library of a service-oriented model wherein someone comes into the library and requests help. But now, especially in the, in the case of Scandinavia, where we have legal deposit laws, those, uh, that, that huge influx of information that's coming in and needs to be stored, there's so many more opportunities for what to do with that information and how to organize it and, and create digital collections with the use of scholars and their expertise in order to reflect the, the local and perhaps the national, um, the culture, and as well as the identity. And I'm very interested in questions like that that help us to understand the opportunity that we now have with the digital to be able to reflect more diverse stories than the ones that we've perhaps seen before. So I think that that's something that the library already has as, as a strength in spades and now just needs to understand how to create a dialogue with scholars and, and strengthen that so that it's actually a really helpful and interesting way that we can talk to each other. For me, the interesting thing today is I think digitization and digital libraries offers um, a, a way for libraries to strengthen their, you know, their task in society, uh, to engage with its communities, particularly the local communities, which I think is a, a, a score that we will see much more from, from libraries. The way that we can sort of interact and collaborate with each other in a, in a more profitable way is definitely based on understanding the skill sets that we're already coming in with. So I think there is in, in some circles, in some scholarly circles, a tendency to think of the library, I suppose, as a service model. Whereas librarians have been working with the TEI and with uh, digital infrastructures for a very long time. So they have those technical skills there as well as their understanding of digitization and their ability to think about the document and the text level, which is something that scholarly editors perhaps need to really, I think, tap into more. This tendency among scholarly editors to you know, receive or order uh, facsimiles and digital images from libraries and archives and just take them face at face value uh, as, you know, objective representations of an original. But um, library staff and particularly photographers and conservationists um, go through a whole series of intellectual uh, demanding uh, processes of managing and producing this digital image. Uh, where they have to decide, make uh, pretty tough decisions about what to keep and what to discard and how to edit uh, the, 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 the image. And this is a knowledge that I think should be brought on to and conveyed to the scholarly editing community to understand mm. that issues of criticism is also involved not only when producing texts, but also when producing images. I have noticed that a lot of the conversations that we've had uh, in, in conferences during the Dixit program have been focused on sustainability issues with digital editions and focused on um, monetization, but, but how do we preserve these beautiful objects that we've created that uh, required so much work for longer than the amount of funding that we receive, so maybe perhaps three, and if we're very lucky, five or so years. And the answer to me is something that's quite obvious, but it seems to be a blind spot perhaps, which is that if you are partnering with a library, they have that skill set, and they have been entrusted with that position for a very long time. I think libraries have this crucial, potentially crucial role in collaboration with scholarly editors and editing projects in particular, if they are on board to start with, so that the project is designed in a way that libraries take on the role of maintenance and long-term preservation, which is not always the case. This should be done at a, at a quite early stage. The decisions that we make to digitize certain collections, those are not value-free. They definitely come with strings attached in the forms of some collections are chosen because a private endowment is given to a library and they want those things to be digitized and that's the reason why it happens. Or there is a political motivation in the sense that we want to digitize this book or this collection because it has immense historical value to this particular country or this subset of our population. 
And so when we think about that in terms of digitizing historical objects now, we are remediating the past. And we are, by definition, imposing some of our current ideas, particularly in, in the structure of annotation and metadata that we attach to those objects and what language they're available in. If you're in a multilingual, multilingual country, are they only available in Danish, say, or in English? Is it possible to find those things on the website? Those are all things that actually add to the conversation and particularly add to the conversation about memory and identity and the relationship there. And what we're looking at in terms of constructing a current identity through what we have as our understanding of the memory of the past. And that is a conversation that shifts and changes over time and is something that is really either a cause or an, always an effect of a digitization plan and a collection and certainly of a scholarly edition. So again, that's something that I think that librarians and information scientists and scholarly editors and textual scholars have in common in terms of the reasons why we decide to, to go forward with the projects that we create.